<laughs> yes, we are all here now. She's ready to learn. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys for being here today. And you again, if you have questions, let me know along the way. Our main focus and goals for this session is to really focus on kind of getting the framework together in your It's Learning course so that it's organized, you have a system for the school year, um, creating folders and organizing stuff. And this goes for if you're using It's Learning a little bit more in depth for the first time, or if you wanna reuse some of your resources from last year, you are welcome to do that. So hopefully end goals in this is that it helps us provide our students with a more clear pathway on how to get to our resources so they can access the lesson materials, be more engaged, and then make learning a little bit more straightforward and exciting for them. Um, it's learning courses for this upcoming school year won't be ready until hopefully earliest the end of this week, later, maybe early next week. I'll let you know via email on that. But if you wanna do any building and practicing today, you can do that in your sandbox course or even your courses you used from last year. Just know that whenever you make something on It's Learning, it can always be copied over. So you never really lose anything either, which is kind of nice. On the flip side though, if you've been with BCSE for a few years, you're probably like, oh my gosh, I have so much It's Learning stuff. How do I make sense of all of this? And hopefully this gives you some strategies and ways to do that as well. All right, so just a little bit of an analogy here to get us started and why it's really important that we really focus on organizing our course first before we start putting lots of resources in there and focusing on all of the assignments and things like that. Organizing our course really sets the tone for how our students are going to learn for the year. Um, so if you think about it, when we look at our physical classroom space, we set up tables and desks in a certain way, or we put one area of the room where students are gonna turn in their work. We set it up so that it's easy for them to follow and know where to go to get resources and where to turn things in. And you want that same practice in your virtual environment as well. You want to give students as much clarity and tools to be successful and help themselves as you possibly can. Um, and if you think about it, if your It's Learning is a bowl of cereal, right? All of your, your cereal is your content and the lessons and stuff that you've made. And the way you've organized it is the utensil and how to get there. And it's a lot easier to eat cereal with a spoon than it is with a fork. You can make all of this awesome stuff, but if it's confusing for the students to get there, then no one really benefits from that. So here in this presentation, I'm gonna focus on a few tips for making your course more organized. And it's okay if you use something different this year than you did last year, or if you even change mid-year. I was someone who, when I started out with It's Learning, I was a folders and pages type of person that was really working for me. I had a page for my week, put my lesson materials and things on there, and that worked. But right before I left the classroom and stepped into this role. Rani, sorry for the interruption. Mm -hmm. uh, as we have already uh, entered the block, I'm preparing mm -hmm. for the advisory, but may I get any help from you or the UDL facilitators, like about the advisory lessons? Yeah, yeah, I think the guidance counselors have been working on stuff for that too. I haven't been super involved in planning lessons for the advisory. I've just been there for its learning support on that, but okay. I would I would touch base with them. Um, yeah, because yesterday we got the email that we have to prepare. So they, uh, they were asking, the, are you preparing for advisory? Which is really, you know, difficult to say yes or no. We can prepare for a couple of days, but not for the whole year. Last I had heard, they were making a there was a Google folder at one point that had a bunch of sample lessons in it. Okay. And it was shared with me. I don't know if they wanted me to put stuff on its learning. I haven't yet, but I can. So I know that there's some lessons out there. So hopefully that's a little bit of relief. It's not starting from scratch, but. Okay, so uh, I will just talk to you um, after this session. Yeah, I would honestly, I would talk with your principals and with Corey. They okay. are gonna be more in the know on that than me. All right, okay, thank you. Yep. All right, so diving in, a um, couple of vocab words to know as we go through this, and these might be familiar because all of us have been in BCSE for a little while now. Um, resources tab, anything and everything you ever make on its learning goes into your resources tab. That includes assessments, pages, folders, it's always saved there. Um, and then folders is how we can organize some things. You can use pages if you like. Planner is another way to organize resources. I'm not gonna dive too far into the planner today. I'll get a little bit of an intro on that if you want to start using it, but there's a more in-depth session on that one later on in this 
it's learning Zoom series because that one can be a little bit more planning up front, but once you start using it, it's pretty amazing. Announcements used to be called bulletins and like the name implies, it's like a short announcement the teacher shares. You can link resources that you've built in your course to that announcement. It's great for just sharing quick little snippets of information for students. They can't really interact with it a whole lot and they can comment on it, but it's again, a great communication tool as well. You can hide or activate and deactivate content in your courses. This is great if you are building a lot of things now before school starts and wanna put them in your course, but don't want students to see those on the first day of school and start diving into things or be overwhelmed with what you see. And then the It's Learning Library is where all of the things you've ever made on It's Learning are always saved there. And it's where you can find other resources that people in BCSC, people around the world that use It's Learning, and people in the US have put there and made it so you can copy content. And it's a great pool of information. And I honestly feel like that feature is underutilized. So hopefully that's one that you can dive into today and get a little bit more exposure to and see that can be some stuff that you can borrow as well. All right, so I'm going to start abandoning my slides now just to warn you, but I will let you know that all of the tools I talk about, I did put a short video in a link to a written guide that goes along with each one of them. So if you wanna have those as a reference or even save this slideshow as a reference, it is all there for you to use. So diving in to the platform, all right. Other thing to know, if you want more, it's learning help. BCSC Connect has a lot of stuff there. There's e-learning, it's learning guides here for every single tool on it's learning. And if you ever click somewhere and it doesn't take you to that right away, you go to resources, it's in the technology folder as well. Um, I know that's quite a rabbit hole to get into BCSC Connect sometimes. It's great because everything's there, but I know personally when I go through and I try to find something, it kind of gives me a headache myself. I wish there was a way that we could tag things and just do a search like almost on Google when the most relevant things come up, but that feature is not there yet. We had an It's Learning development meeting with some of their developers, and that's like the number one thing that was requested is the ability to search within a course and find things a little bit faster. So we'll see if they listen. They have recently, so I'm optimistic. All right, so when we go to our course, by default, this is what you would typically see. Um, a few years ago when we switched to Modern View, It's Learning went to this new look by default, which has this course overview look, which we know is not as dynamic as what the course dashboard used to be. You can't add as many pictures and content and things like that. You can't necessarily manipulate the content blocks. Um, but for the upcoming school year, we are creating courses on It's Learning a little bit differently in that you're getting content in your course put there for you already. They're created from a template. And if that template works the way that I've been promised it would, then for all elementary courses, your course start page is not default to this. It's default to a page, which is about what 99% of you do anyway. I think there's about two people in the district that didn't use a page as their start page at the elementary level. So I'm just gonna show you what this course template looks like so you have an idea on some content that will be in your course at the start of the year. And things to know with this template, when you get your It's Learning courses, they will have some of these elements in them. All of them can be customized. You can add your own bits and pieces to it. This was just to give you a kind of a skeleton to work with in your course. You can add in your own pieces and things there instead of starting with nothing. And this came from feedback from teachers, from coaches and facilitators, parents and students. And even talking with It's Learning, we're one of the only customers that they have that doesn't give teachers a template. So. I kind of feel like that was a sign that we should do something a little bit differently. So by default, elementary teachers, this is what your page will start with. Um, so you can delete, edit these things. When this gets added to your course, you might notice right away that there's not the ability to edit right away. The three dot button in the corner is how you can do that. You would just create your own copy. It prompts you to make a copy if you want to make one. Are you sure? You would click yes, refresh the page. And then you have your own ability to add your own picture, your own video there, any other things that you want, and it's all set. And the idea behind this start page is that it gives students a welcome, a hello from you, and it gives them links to past lessons or current lessons. Now, the first week of school is probably isn't going to be the most relevant content block because you won't have anything there yet. But the idea behind this was that when we were doing e-learning, some students had a hard time figuring out 
where do I go if I was absent a few weeks ago or if I fell behind? How do I find my lessons from a few weeks ago? And this is kind of a way to help them. Um, and all this is is just linking to a folder in your course. So we'll walk through building folders and then linking on there. And then this last content block that was added is just it's learning and tech help. This is where the teacher could add their own email address if they wanted to so the students know. Um, a little tutorial on how to message on its learning in case students need that. Some of our kindergarten and first grade students are still learning how to use this platform. They're still learning how to use a computer, so it's helpful to put that there. And then a hotline as well. And again, you don't have to keep those resources, but it's just there if you want them. So that's the start page by default for elementary. Our PETA for secondary, you will have this course homepage in your course as well. It's just not set is the start page. This is one of your resources in your course. Okay. All right. So that's going to be in all of your courses at the start of the year. You can customize it, make it look pretty, do whatever you want. Um, the other thing that's going to be in there is just not even daily or maybe it's weekly, whatever you want to call this page. I struggled with the names. I want to call it a lesson page, but I didn't know whether I should call that weekly or daily. So you can change that as well if you want to. But this will also be in your course. Um, and elementary folks, it has some of your links added right there. There's a section over here for you to write the lesson goal or standards that are associated with that week or that lesson and a space to write instructions and to put a video if you want. And again, the tech help as well if they need that. And the idea is that this page is linked on that first page I showed you, that sample start page, so that you can kind of go back and forth. You'll also have this page, elementary teachers, as promised, added to your courses. You don't have to go about adding those yourself. It's there for you. Notice typing club's not there. That did get cut from the budget to help pay for IXL. So sometimes that's the way the cookie crumbles, right? We tried to keep it, but. And the last thing that's gonna be in your course is this page which is a series of student It's Learning guides. So these are all self-help resources for students on using It's Learning, and they're in English and they're in Spanish. So how to add pictures, add video, micro, uh, how to use your microphone and record audio, and how to post in a discussion. They're all there for students. And that kind of came out of our feedback from e-learning as well. I could reverse time, I would have had these all made before nine weeks of e-learning, but about six weeks in is when I was like, oh, maybe I should have made those and shared those with teachers. And at that point, most kids have figured it out. But hey, hindsight's always 2020. Now we have them. All right. And for Arpita, just to show you what the secondary courses will look like, this is your default start page, but yep. you have all of the same resources that elementary has. So you'll have this sample course page that you can use is your home page where it has info for you to add a welcome page, welcome video, link to past instructions, daily lesson page if you so choose to use that, the it's learning tips for students. And then one other thing for secondary, technically this is going into the elementary courses as well, but more of our secondary teachers use plans. If you use the planner as the way to structure lessons in your It's Learning courses, mm -hmm. other change that we implemented was giving you some set columns. So you always remember to add these elements into your lesson plans. Oh. Teachers were going through and setting these up in their plans anyway. So we just took that step out of the process for you. So if you ever make a plan on It's Learning, these are the elements that your students will see. For you to write your goal and instructions there, for you to add standards, resources and activities, which is just a page or assignment you make on its learning. Mm -hmm. Feature notes there if you wanted to share your contact information or a reminder about a due date. So this is technically in the elementary one as well, but I don't know if this is relevant to elementary teachers. I know there's only about two grade levels in all of elementary that use the planner and use it regularly. So it just doesn't, I don't think it makes as much sense for especially younger elementary school kids to use the planner, but it is there as well. 
So that is just an overview about some of the content that will be in your course that hopefully aids in this organization and setting things up for the start of the year. Uh, I'm sorry, could you please just guide me one more time how to start discussion? How to do what? Discussion board. Oh, we're not doing discussion boards today, Arpita. Oh, okay, okay. That's, that's later this week. Okay. That one can be its own beast. But I can send you the one pager on that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are these templates available now or do we have to wait until they get everything updated? Technically, they're in the It's Learning Library and you could copy the resources. Okay. For me to make the template, I had to share it in the library as a part of this process. So they're there. Okay. But they will be in your courses when they're made. Okay. So if you want to wait, you can, but technically you don't have to. Okay. If you want to start customizing and doing your own thing, yeah. Trust me, I get it. It's like killing me that these courses aren't ready yet because mm -hmm. usually they're ready by the 4th of July. And I really prided myself on getting them ready earlier and earlier. And then this happened and I'm like, dang it. <laughs> All right, so that is just the overview on the templates. Now we're gonna go into organizing courses and all those fun things. So hopefully that gives a little bit of framework there on how you can set up your course. So other tips and pointers here, um, resources where everything's saved. Folders, if you're using that whole uh, setup where it's a page, is your start page for your course and that's really where you're putting your lessons and organizing it in that way, folders might be a helpful resource to use. So if you click the add button and show all, folder is one of the options that comes up when the show all menu comes up. And things to know with a folder is that you do have this rich text editor here, so you can always add more content other than just the name of the folder if you want to. You can put links, pictures, video, whatever you want is there is there too. So if maybe you want to link back to that start page, you could, but you don't have to. I know most teachers just put the name. They either do it by week or unit. I'll just do unit. Um, other thing to know here, I'm going to move my video. There we go. It's covering half my screen. So on the bottom here, you can set them to where this folder and its contents will be active right away. But if you know this is something a few weeks into the school year, you might want to have that hidden or it's only active for a certain time span. So this is where you can toggle that to where it's not active right away. And save. And whenever you add something to this folder, it automatically inherits that folder setting. So everything will be hidden to the students visible to you, which is another helpful piece. So to add things to this, you can add just from here. I'm in this folder right now, add content, whatever I want to do. Um, or I can use left-hand side, add from there. Or if I want to drag something over that I've already made, I can either drag and drop into that folder which sometimes I have a hard time doing. I tend to try to do that and then I don't actually add the item into the folder. I know I've added it if I get that message. The other way I can add things into folders really quickly is if I go to my resources tab and I select all of this stuff, or if I select item by item, action, move to, it pulls up my resources in this course eventually. There we go. And I can select that folder and move my resources there. All right. It's the same thing for making things active and inactive. I can deactivate everything at once, even though most of those things were deactivated. I can activate everything at once. This little actions drop down arrow is really great for saving time when you're doing some of this stuff. Now, if you are playing around in a course from 2019-2020 and you want to add this to win your new courses when they are eventually made, this little button here is also your best friend for copying things over. So if I wanted to copy over from my resources tab, anything in this course, I can select everything that I want to copy over or just individual items, action, copy to, 
And then initially it just keeps me in my course, but this drop down menu shows me any course that I'm enrolled in, whether it's archived or it's active. So I could copy into, as you can see, I'm in a lot of courses. This is a side effect of being in lots of people's courses to help them during e-learning. Find a sample one. There we go, my other test course. So I can select the course I want to add it to. Then I can even select folders in those courses too, if I want to put it in a folder of upcoming lessons or however I want to arrange this. I can copy over all my stuff from past years there. This is an option, but it doesn't really make sense to include submissions from past school year, your past students' responses, partly because those students are going to be removed. So it might do some weird things with data in your course. So I typically just leave that alone. And if I don't select a folder that it's going to be copied into, it just puts it at the bottom of my resources tab in my course. So it does take a few minutes if you're copying over a lot of content like I just did. But once it does, it lets you know that it'll give you notification as soon as it's finished because it was a lot of content. Questions over any of those details? All right, so if you are using a page as your main starting point for your course, and you want to link to a folder of lessons for the week. So if you have that past lessons content block or current or upcoming lessons, however you want to have that set up, it's helpful to first make the content block. So I'm actually going to see what's set up here. All right, so this is my little content block for my current and past lessons. And let's say that my week one folder was last week's lessons and I want to have that linked here in this content block because maybe now we're in week two of the school year. So I have my week one folder over here and this is my, this is the way that I like to do this. It's a faster way for me personally, um, but other people might actually go open the folder, copy the URL from the top, but I think that's a little bit too many steps for me. So if I'm here in my course, what I do is I hover over this on the left-hand side of my screen. I right-click and then copy link address. So right-click and then copy link address. And now I'm going to edit this content block. So I'm going to type out whatever I want that text to read like, highlight it, and then this link button here at the top, it's beside the flag and the little table button. If you ever want to know what a button is, if you hover over it, it will tell you. So if I click my link button, here is where I'm going to paste that link address that I just copied. So you can right click and paste or if you use keyboard shortcuts, control V. I'll click OK and click OK. And then I'm always paranoid about if I actually copied the link correctly. So I always test my links because I've failed many a times in doing this. So if I click week one lessons, there we go. It takes me to that. So the key first step on this is copying the link address for your folder first and then editing that, adding that link to that in your content block. And my recommendation is that if you're adding links to past lessons, make a folder for that week so that it just has everything there when the students get to it. So when they get to week one, it has Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you don't have to be adding a link every single time for Monday's lessons, Tuesday's lesson. It just saves some time for you. And then if you have to go through and add any additional resources to Tuesday's lesson or Wednesday's lesson, you still have it set up to where it's in that folder. You don't have to worry about editing your link later on. All right, so that is how you can use folders and then linking to them in a content block. All right. Next thing we're going to talk about is let's see, I think I was going to do bulletins and pages. Nope. All right. 
what's our comfort level with its learning pages? We're probably all masters of it now after <laughs> e-learning. <laughs> I kind of jumped ahead there by showing you how to add content blocks in them. Um, I think I am going to show just a little tip for embedding things on pages because I know sometimes that can be a little finicky. All right, so adding a page through add button up here in the top corner, it's one of the most common tools on its learning, so it will always show up there. Or just through the resources button and add content block and then rich content, that is probably your best friend on its learning. The other options that are there are okay, but they're not as dynamic as this tool. You're a little bit more limited in what you can do and how you can enlarge pictures and the size of them. And that's why I kind of prefer using a rich content block because I feel like it's a little bit more flexible than some of the other tools. So if I wanted to add a content block here, and maybe it had my slideshow for the day. Um, when I was in the classroom, I used, I didn't give lectures every day with slides, but I used slides as my way to always communicate. This is our goal. This is our assignments and tasks for today. And this is what you need to have done or any upcoming due dates. So it kind of became a way for me to structure, even keep myself organized as a teacher. So I'd always put those uh, on its learning for my students. So Nothing like typing in front of people and misspelling things. All right. So if I want to embed my Google slideshow on here, I can always just put a link to it. So I have my slideshow open in another tab. I'll type out my word there and how I want it to look when it's linked. Click the hyperlink button. Let's say this is a slideshow I want to share with my students. Share. And then I'll copy my link. Go back to its learning, paste it there, click OK. Now I have a link. But if I wanted to embed my slideshow so that they can view it all within its learning and I have another tab open on their device because that can get a little messy, it's a couple of steps in Google and then on its learning. But it honestly gets to be second nature after you do it a couple times and you'll find yourself wanting to embed everything on there because it just looks a little bit cleaner. So if I have my slideshow open, I'm gonna go to file. And then under my file menu here in slides, I'm gonna do publish to the web, which sounds really scary, but it's not. It's not making all of your stuff out there for anyone to find. It just makes it so you can get the embed code for your slides. All right, so if I click publish to the web, there's a link there. What you want to click is embed. And then I don't actually mess with any of the settings there. You can, you can set it up to where your slideshow will automatically advance on its own, which maybe you want to do that for your students. I didn't do that because I just figured they can click through it at their own speed if they want, because I taught middle school and they were going to do that anyway. <laughs> Usually they click through it lightning fast, but hey, it's a part of it. So it'll ask you if you want to publish the selection and you'll click yes. And there is the embed code. So you'll notice that after you do that, it gives you this magical embed stuff that you'll copy. So it gives you a hint here and it says control C copy and it has all of it selected for you. If you happen to click out and you're like, oh no, how do I copy all of this? Control A or double clicking and this spot selects everything. Control A is another one of my keyboard hack best friends. It keeps me from having to click and then hold and drag things. But I usually am not very efficient at that. So copy that. And here's where it's a little different than what you think it might be. It's Learning has this lovely embed button, which works great for YouTube videos, but does not place a knife with Google Slides. If you've noticed before, if you tried to embed a Google Slides presentation and you click embed, it just gives like a preview of your document. It doesn't truly embed it. So instead of actually clicking the embed button, over here on the far right of all of these buttons beside the question button is the source button. So if you click source, it's gonna make things look a little scary at first. It's gonna bring up some HTML code and you're like, oh gosh, I'm not wanting to do that. The first time I did this, I'm like, I'm not a computer programmer. I don't like the way this looks, but it's, 
it won't be scary. So you click source, it's going to make it look funny for a second. And this is where you paste that embed code that we just copied. And you'll know that you copied it correctly if the first part of it says iframe. iframe is that box for your slides when it's embedded. All right? So we click source, we pasted the embed code. We're going to click source again. And there is my embedded presentation where I can resize it however I want. Whenever I'm finished with that, I can keep adding more content and things below it if I want, instructions for my students, but if I'm happy with the way it looks, I'll click OK. And now my slideshow is embedded on my page. So the key thing is to file, publish to the web, where you will go to the embed menu and copy all that code. When you copy the code and you go back to its learning in your content block, and really you could do this anywhere, you could do this wherever you see that source button. It does not have to be on a page, it can be an assignment, whatever you want. You'll go to source, maybe in there twice now, paste it, source again, and then you can resize it because by default, it usually puts a mega size Google Slides presentation in there that takes up the kids' whole screen which I guess is a really great way to get their attention, but might be a little distracting. All right, so that's how you can embed some of your content and things onto your page. All right, other thing to know with the page, if you have a content block from a past It's Learning page that you've made, and you don't want to copy the whole page, you just want to copy a specific content block, there's also a way you can do that. So if I really like, I don't even remember what's on this page, to be honest. Oh, wow. So this is me just messing around with something, apparently. But if I really wanted to keep this little picture of the Nile River in this really vague sentence and add that to another page on its learning, but not copy everything that's on here, if I go to my edit menu on my page, the source button is also your best friend for copying specific content blocks as well. So if I click source, shows me this, I'm going to do control all to select all of this or just highlight everything. So I'll select everything on that source and I'll copy it. So copy. And then I'll get out of that view. So I copied the stuff in that content block. And let's say this other page I was working on is where I wanted to add that content block that I wanted to copy. So I would add a new content block. I'm going to click the source button again. I'm going to paste that source code I just copied. Click source again. And voila, there's all the stuff that I just copied. That also works for assignments. Anywhere where you have that source button, that means you can copy all of that HTML code that's in that box or in that space. Put anywhere else you want, customize it, whatever have you. So this might be helpful if by chance you have the elementary curriculum resources page with all those links and linked pictures in your course, but you want to add maybe that wonders link somewhere else, if you copy the source code for that wonders, it will automatically put that wonders linked picture icon wherever you want. That's kind of another time saving hack on its learning as well. I get that question a lot at the start of the year because people want to copy elements from pages, but not the whole thing and want to piece together stuff. And this is kind of the way to do that. All right. Will that work when you're um, looking at somebody else's page also? You'd have to have editing access to that page to be able to do it. So okay. if you're, if you copy. So we have a shared page. resources page, but we normally just cop it and then cut the page, copy it to our course, cut the page, and then take out a content block. 
Yeah, so if you are looking at that original template, if you have editing access to that, then you should be able to do the source code. Or if you copy that page into your course and then make your own copy, then you could do whatever as well. Can you show, and I don't know if this is planned later in the week or today, but can you show how to embed the YouTube videos? Yeah. And there's really two ways of doing this. I thought I was doing a way that was what everyone else was doing until I went to a training and everyone's like, that's not how I embed YouTube videos. So I'll show you both ways and you can pick whichever one you like to use. I, I like to use a little source code button because it's never let me down. So that's kind of been my fail safe. But I know other teachers like to actually use the true embed button on its learning embed videos and that one works fine. Um, but since it doesn't work for Google Slides, I think I just kind of stopped using that button, but it's, it's still there and you can use that one. So if I go to YouTube, I have no idea what's going to show up here. So, all right, obstacle challenge, dogs and cats. It's a gamble every time we open up YouTube. I was just listening to the Hamilton soundtrack, so I was kind of afraid it was going to be blasting in your guys' ears because it was playing in another tab when I first started this call. And I'm like, I don't know where that music is coming from. Okay, so if I wanted to embed this video into my course. I think I actually have to wait for this ad to go through before I can do that. It's not gonna show the BCSC button. Oh, hold on a second, guys. I'm gonna be in my BCSC account. All right. So this used to be a blue button. I'm not sure why it's not blue anymore, but when you are using YouTube videos, elementary especially, um, you have to approve the video for BCSE K-12. So I'm gonna approve this. Hopefully I don't get in trouble for approving an obstacle cat dog challenge, but we're gonna do it anyway. <laughs> I think those things go to me anyway, so I can just approve my approval. Okay, so once you've approved it, it won't have that little message there anymore. And you'll click the share button. And this is where I guess maybe I was making things more complicated <laughs> than what other people were doing. So technically, from what another teacher showed me, if you just click the copy button, and it's just the URL link for the video, if you click copy, and then you go to its learning, there it is. And you click the embed button, You paste the URL, it gives you a preview, and that's how you know that it worked, should work for your students. You'll just paste that URL that you copied, and you'll click insert, and then it puts it there. It just doesn't, the only thing with this that I've learned is that it doesn't quite let you resize sometimes the way you want it to, but it is there. If you click OK is where it'll give you the better display of what that video looks like. The way we did that is we just share, copy that link, and use the embed button, which is beside the math equation one. The other way that you can do this is by using the source button. And it's a little bit different on YouTube as well. So if I am changing how I want to do this, on YouTube. I would still have to approve that video first. That's always that initial step there. I'll click share, go to the embed button. Whenever you see an iframe, that means that it's something that can be embedded. So that, that goes across the board for other things you might find on the internet. If you can embed something and it has iframe at the first phrase there, that means it can be embedded on its learning. So I'll copy that code. I just did that keyboard, but there's a copy button right there. Wow, learn something new. All right, go back to It's Learning, and I'll just use that same source process. So I'll click the source button, paste in that code that I just copied on YouTube. Click the source button again. And this automatically changes the size of the YouTube video to where it's a little bit bigger, so you don't have to resize it yourself. 
So just preference, you can use either way, either way works. The key thing is just making sure you approve the video and that it's embedded using either one of those processes on its learning. Um, last year, we made that, maybe it was two years ago, we made the change for elementary students where they couldn't watch a video on YouTube unless it was approved and embedded on its learning. And as a lot of us learned during e-learning, um, that restriction was lifted a little bit, where if you put a video or you shared a video link, elementary kids could get to YouTube and watch the videos without it necessarily having to be embedded. And the reason why we did that was so that if a teacher was embedding a YouTube video in a Google Slides presentation, which a lot of teachers were doing, you could still watch the video. This is the last thing we wanted was during e-learning was to have a teacher who spent tons of time on a Google Slides presentation, and that was her lesson for the day, and it had videos, and then the students getting an error message just because it was embedded in slides. Right now, that's still the setup. I haven't talked with Nick. He's really the one who controls the web filter for elementary students. My guess is because everything is so unclear and we'll have some students in the classroom and some not, that it makes sense to do what we did during e-learning and make it so that if you're watching YouTube video and slides, that's fine. You guys are all nodding your head, so I'll say that's what teachers want when I talk to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, I just, I just finished making a bunch of slides and they all have stuff embedded. Yep. within it so yeah that would be helpful or if that does change to have a heads up yeah yeah yep i'll, I'll fight tooth the nail to keep that in place because it just makes sense and our students have the most limited profile on youtube anyway they can't just go and watch whatever they want usually it was parents that drove that other decision but Balancing the two, right? Okay. Other tidbits. We have about 12 or so minutes left. Um, other thing I wanted to show you guys is using the library on its learning to copy things over. Um, this is just helpful for borrowing and stealing ideas and copying things from other people, which we never, we never have enough time to always reinvent the wheel. So this is always a great way to take advantage of other people's hard work. So if you click the library tab across the top of your It's Learning banner, this is how you can get to the It's Learning library. And there's a lot of stuff in here, like millions of resources. And it's not all stuff that BCSE teachers have made. It's kind of a mix between teachers that use It's Learning in our state, in the United States, and then even across the world, because It's Learning is really popular in um, Europe. I think actually like most of France uses its learning as their sole provider. Same with Germany and most of Norway as well. So if you're on the library tab, you can search. And there's actually, I'm just going to do this one because I know there's some resources. So I search for a keyword. Brings up all kinds of resources and I can filter my search even further if I want. I can filter by grade level. I can filter by standards if I want. And those standards aren't necessarily, they're not always the most updated standards because Indiana is a little different. We don't, we don't use Common Core. Some of the ones that are in there are Common Core standards that you can filter by, but if you know those and how they match up with Indiana standards, you can kind of compare and get your resources there. You can look for specific types of items. So if you're looking for an e-learning assignment, you can find it. If you're looking for a page, there's tons of resources here from the company Guru. And a lot of those are vocab activities, there's videos, there's fun little interactive pieces that we all have free access to. So you can look for those. There's also Khan Academy videos that are also technically, those are Guru resources as well, because that's the home company. But there's Khan Academy videos, there's lots of stuff. There's pictures, interactive elements, games, audio files. There's a lot of hidden gems here within the library that don't always get used a lot because we think, oh, we have to build everything on our own and build our own content. And it's kind of helpful to pull some of this sometimes. So if I wanted to copy any one of these resources into my course, 
Let me see what this one was. All right. So I select the resource. If I just want to view this to see if it's what I want before I add it, it opens it in a new tab so I don't lose where I was. So I can look at it there. If I want to copy it, I'll click add to. And I can add it to my collection, which is kind of a almost like a Pinterest board within its learning where it saves all of these things that you have made or things that you find in the library that you like. So you can always go back and reference them. So I can add it to my collection. That's what that is. And it's your collection is in the library, just to exit out of that for a second, it's over here. In the library, we did a search, but collections there. If I add that to my collection, that's how I can get back to it. But if I know for sure, oh, I want to add this to my course right now, this is something that is helpful. I can click add to, add to course. And then I'll select what course I want to add this into from this drop down menu. Wow, I just clicked the wrong thing. Sorry, guys. I'm going to backtrack here for a second. I just added that to a random person's course. So hopefully they don't get a, <laughs> upset by that. Oh, goodness. I think it was added the BCSC UDL facilitators course. So, oops. All right. So I can find the course I want to add it to. And then it pulls up my resources tab from that course. So any and all folders that I've made, so I can add it to a specific one if I would like to. And I can even go even further than that. So if I have multiple for folders, I can keep going on through the line until I find the folder that I want to add it to. And then what I would do is click add. And in the bottom right, it'll give me a confirmation message that I added it to the course and I can click go to course to see where it was added or I could keep searching for things in the library if I want. So it takes me to the folder where I added it and it automatically puts it at the bottom of that folder at the bottom of your resources tab if you didn't pick a folder. And from there, if I wanted to be able to edit this, because I copied it from the library, someone else is the owner of it. So I don't have editing access right away but I can make a copy of it. So if I click the three dot button and do create own copy, it'll take a second, but it makes one for me so I can edit and do whatever I made with that. So this is also a way if you're working with your grade level and your building, or maybe you're working with other teachers that are in a different grade level in other buildings, um, it's a great way to share resources across the district with each other because if you put it in the library and you add it there, then anyone has access to it. So if I wanted to publish something from the library, three dot button here in the corner is how I could do that. So if I want to make it to where other teachers in my building could borrow my resource, three dot button, add to library, and then a menu comes up. By default, it sets it to add and publish and publish means that other people can see it. So I usually just put template or something very general there. And if you add the keywords, this makes it so that if someone types in those words, it comes up at the top of the search results. All right. And by default, it will be set to, it'll probably be set to Bartholomew Consolidated for you all, but it's set at its learning community for me. But if it's set at Bartholomew, then anyone in BCSE can see it. You want to change that to just your school then you can do that too you would see that in some of these options here and it won't look as messy as mine um, but if you leave it at bcse there advanced options just allow you to add a grade level or standards to it and if you have other categories you want to add here i always leave it to where someone can make a copy of my stuff because i figured that's what the library is there for is for people to borrow ideas from each other and you click add and then it tells you that you added it to the library. So if you make any edits to it, it will be reflected on that library copy. So that's another helpful way to copy resources over and just use things that other people have made in your courses. Last thing I wanna show you before we have a little bit of time for questions is using the announcements 
feature on its learning course. Um, and this is maybe not one you'll use all the time, but I always like to put a couple of things there so that if a student happen to navigate outside of my resources tab or they closed a page that had my daily lesson resources, they had another reminder on how to get there because I kind of felt like no matter how much you communicate, it's always helpful to have one more resource for the students to get to where they need to be. And announcements are a way to share short snippet information with your students. So an example of one I had here is just technology help and how to get in contact with your teacher. So to add an announcement, start typing. Or you could add a folder. Actually, I'll do a folder instead, so it's again following what I was telling you guys to do earlier. All right, you can add more than just text here to an announcement. You can link to resources and things that you made in your course. So if I click add resource, it brings up all of the things that I've made. So if I want to make sure my students don't get lost and still can find the lessons that they need to take part in. I can select the item here and click add and then add announcement. Because again, sometimes they might click off somewhere else and this is a way for them to click that and then get back to your lesson page or your lesson resources and folder if you need to. So this is something you could do maybe at like the start of the year, just put a couple of like basic links and things there is short little announcements to help that one random student who might get lost in case you need it, but it's, it's helpful. And you can even schedule them out in advance if you want to, or you can disable content, not content, comments, um, delete it, whatever you wanna have. Because the only way students can interact with an announcement is add a comment. And if you're not wanting them to comment, then you can turn that off. They probably, they won't be on this overview tab a ton, but it's helpful to have a few things there in case they get lost. All right, we only have a few minutes left, so if you have questions or anything else you'd want me to show you, I can for sure do that. We covered everything on here and then a little bit more, which I thought I was being a little ambitious with putting some of these things on here, but that's some good stuff. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, back at the very beginning, you were talking about organization and you had the cereal pictures and the fork and spoon and all that. And you said, you started to say you were a folder and pages person for a long time. And then you became what? Someone who used the planner. And I'm wondering about that. Now, yeah, yeah. Fourth grade, I mean, so, I mean, I'll, I'll do the planner. I mean, I'll do the planner session. Um, but I wondered about that. So with folder and page, it's folder and pages, but also PowerPoint links and slideshows and things. Yeah, so the thing with the planner Later you is, got all into the planner. Yeah, I, I would just, when I first started with It's Learning, um, my first two years of teaching, I used folders and pages, and I would just, I would make a folder for the week, and then right. I would make a page for, Ideally, I'd make one for every single day, but sometimes that didn't happen. It takes forever. A couple of days, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it takes and forever. The, I kind of set the expectation for myself that on my daily page, it would always have my guiding slideshow where mm -hmm. students could get the goal and the information that they needed for the day. And then if I had other stuff, I could put it there. But that was kind of the expectation I set for myself was to always have some type of information on what we did that day in class because I had students who were gone or absent from time right. to time. And the folders in the right. paper were just kind of how initially I was like, oh, it's almost like a filing cabinet where if I open this drawer, I have lessons for this week and then for this unit. But the thing with the plans that initially I was really hesitant about diving into is it sounded like this whole new way of structuring everything on its learning. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I've done all this work. I don't want to start over again and start from scratch. And it's really not. It takes plans you could use all the same folders and content you yeah. already made. It's just plugging in a little bit different. And the thing that I like about plans is that they're really great if you have a sub, number one. And if you're wanting students to kind of have a self-paced way of going through things, they're great for that. And I'm gonna show you an example. I think I might have one. It seems like the plans would help parents understand things too, if they were looking 
Yeah, really. Although most of my kids were working very independently. Yeah. While their parents were working do either at their job. You know, I mean, it was just hard. And it just, it depends. I know that there's, there's a school district in Georgia that we kind of bounce ideas off of quite a bit. They use its learning and they're a little bit similar to us and the number of buildings they have and number of students they have. And they started having their elementary teachers in grades, I think four and up start using the planner is kind of like mm -hmm. a last year. And I actually kind of copied the way that they set up their plans in our course template because I really like the idea. But again, it's not, it's not a requirement. Um, so with plans. No, but what was their feedback? I mean, after doing that, I wonder. They used it during e-learning and they liked using plans because whenever you have a plan that's active, which is equivalent of like having a folder active, it puts a play button on this course overview page. And that's what I was trying to find was an example of where I had one. I think I do in one course. This is the problem. I've made so many guinea pig courses to just play around and dump content in that now I'm like, where did I put that? Okay. I'm gonna pages. So you can see what I was talking about with that play button. So the thing with plans is it it doesn't really make sense to use them if you're using the course start page. Is it actually you do one or the other? You could okay. do that, but it'd be the same thing as copying a link in, but you just wouldn't be able to use this play button that I'm about to show you. I'm gonna go into student mode. All right. So if I make a plan on its learning, this is what it looks like for my students. They see this play button. When they go through the lesson, it takes them through things step by step. And you're thinking, well, this looks different. This is a content block that I added. Standards that I linked with it. And then the next thing it would do is if when I built my plan, if I had any assignments or pages or it's learning tests, they would all be right here when I'm building this. And when the student sees it, it would be a part of one of those steps that they're going through. So it basically just takes all the things you would have in a folder or all the things you would have on a page on its learning and puts them in a step-by-step -step format for your students. So it's an option um, and I will get to think, think about it. on that on the planner session, which I can't remember what day that is off the top of my head. It, it's on the, yeah, it's not me. It's okay. And I'm not sure which, which is better. Honestly, you could you could try it. I maybe I was evil for doing this, but I don't want to jam my I switch mid year for my students. Well, <laughs> they didn't hurt them. They just you know you just had to walk them through learning it. But I like what you all have set up. You know, I like the folder and the start page that you guys have set up for everybody. I think that will help a lot. If this the consistency, even if we all modify it a little bit, it's still the consistency for mm -hmm. kids and families and that was the biggest piece that came up in survey after survey and that was my honest feedback number one thing was consistency yeah it's really hard to be on the phone lines and answering calls from parents when I'm like okay where do I find this resource yeah and then I felt bad because I'm and like how did that teacher set that up you know yeah oh you, know. you had to learn pretty quick on your feet which sometimes was okay but other times I was like Ugh, we did yeah then maybe it would help everyone out. So yeah. there is tomorrow at 1 p.m. Okay. On that one. Yeah, I'll come check it out. Yeah. Because I'm honestly not sure. I like the organization of it, but you know. What What is your reason for saying that it would be better for secondary than for like a primary, like K-1? I guess maybe better isn't the right word choice. More secondary teachers have used the planner. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I think 
when we first started out with its learning with the course dashboards and adding pictures and making it look colorful and adding the pictures almost as buttons for elementary mm -hmm. students to click, that really seemed to fit what elementary students and teachers were wanting whereas the planner was a little bit more text heavy in the way it looks okay which you can still you can edit things in the planner to where it doesn't look like that and there are some elementary teachers who use the planner and swear by it and that's their thing but i would say more secondary teachers use it than elementary okay what about when you say secondary i know you mean high school but how are the middle school teachers in terms of using where are they with using the planner are it's, they it varies out of the planner yeah it varies um it mix okay i used it when i taught middle school i used it when i taught high school towards the end of teaching high school i use more pages and folders my years using uh, teaching high school because that was when we first started its learning and that's honestly what was presented to me first with using folders sure so i think that's why i gravitated to that um but i know that when its learning comes and visits the lady who trains people says that now she usually shows people plans is one of her de first demo things because a lot more people have started to find more success with that but again there's there's great ways to make lessons in either one it's just kind of it's helpful to go oh. And see what works for you and get your students' feedback. And well, I'm just thinking about what's most efficient. Yeah. For us and also what's most clear for them. So that could be a whole nother session. 